Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, we're just going to wait a few moments. You can hear those little dings, which are people joining uh, the room. Uh, while you're waiting, um, there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, you can introduce yourself in the chat, uh, tell us um, where you're watching from, uh, what zoo, what country. Um, but also, if you do want to change uh, your name on the screen, you can go to the top right hand corner, you'll see uh, three, th three blue dots just in the corner, right hand corner of your screen, um, your picture, and then you'll be able to say uh, what zoo or aquarium you're from. So just so we know who's in the room so we can get ready for a, a great conversation. Uh, so my name is Sarah Thomas. Um, you can see I'm uh, based at Auckland Zoo in New Zealand. So it is evening time for me. Um, tell us where you're watching from and we'll just give it a couple more minutes um, before we get going. Okay, so it is uh, three minutes past. I can see that we've uh, started to put where we're watching from in the chat. Any of you watching from home, uh, hopefully you can see where people are from on our screen. Um, we're gonna get going. I'll just start with some introductions and some housekeeping and then we'll you'll hear people kind of join us uh, to get going with the discussion. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, we are in the, the second of our ISAD uh, reading groups. Um, and, and this session is designed for you. It was asked for by the Zoo and Aquarium community. And it's the second in the in the series around um, social change for conservation, the World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy. So if you watch the first series, you know that we had a series of case studies and presentations and a bit of a panel discussion, whereas actually the feedback was we want more kind of um, details, we want more discussion, and so that's what these sessions are designed for. So hopefully what you've done is you've had a read of chapter two, uh, which is all around embedding multiple purposes um, in conservation education in zoos and aquariums. You've had a refresh, you know what we're talking about. Um, we have four, including myself, um, of the ISAD board in the room, as well as, as the audience. And the idea is that we've got some uh, questions from the audience and also from the board that we're gonna start um, chatting through. You'll be able to ask questions uh, in the chat. So you'll be able to kind of uh, use the icons to put your hand up. It really is as much participation as, as you want. Now, if you want to leave your cameras off, if you're eating dinner, eating your breakfast, having a cup of tea, that's okay. Um, you can just sit back and listen and hopefully you'll enjoy the discussion. Uh, we really do want to make it really useful for you and really practical and we'll hopefully be sharing more ideas and more kind of links about where you can get more information. Um, so I can see that we have, uh, we, we'll get ready to go. Um, bit of housekeeping, um, if you're staying and you're participating, uh, then we are gonna record it. You can see the recording is in progress. And so what happens is that this recording gets onto our ISAD YouTube channel. So just to know that by staying and participating, you are giving your permission to be recorded and have that put on the ISAD YouTube channel. And anybody who's watching this later at home, um, welcome. Uh, hopefully you'll get uh, all through the conversation. We'll just keep kind of bringing out the chat into our conversations to make sure you don't miss anything. There's no uh, presentations, there's no slides. So again, you don't need to, to watch it. You can just listen away uh, and we'll get going with the discussion. So um, before we get, do how, get into the <coughs> content, I do want uh, for us to, to meet the, the panel, the board. Um, what I'll do is we'll go uh, Aphantus, then Leanne, and then Kim. Uh, so Aphantus, if you want to introduce yourself first, 
Yes, uh, our colleagues, uh, educators, welcome. My name is uh, Fantas Mugo. I'm the Conservation Education Program Coordinator for Lewa, which is in Kenya. And um, I also represent uh, Africa in the IZD board. So welcome, everyone. Thanks, Fantas. Over to Leanne. Thanks, uh, Leanne Wilson. I head up community conservation and learning at Zoo Victoria um, in Australia. Uh, and I'm also IZD's uh, journal editor. So um, we are gonna go do a really quick plug um, as while we're in the reading group, think about any programs that you have that you'd like to share in the journal because we'll be doing a call for abstracts um, next month. Thanks. Thanks, Leanne and Kim. All right, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us. My name is Kim Horman. I am the secretary treasurer for IZE currently. Uh, prior to that, I was the social media editor for three years. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Kim. And um, as I said before, I'm uh, based at Auckland Zoo in New Zealand. Uh, my role is the head of conservation advocacy and engagement, but I also have a role on the IZE board as the regional rep for Oceana. So you've got us four uh, talking through chapter two, um, and we're gonna just start with general comments around um, the, the chapter. And uh, when I was rereading it, um, you know, it's always good to kind of have a refresh. Uh, it reminded me, you know, when we think about the purpose, when we think about the why, because that's what this chapter is all about, it's a really interesting kind of reflection. You know, if you say, do you know what your purpose is in life, in the zoo? In your family, um, it's it's quite a big question to answer, and so this is one of the one of the reasons why it's in the strategy is because we got a lot of feedback saying that uh, zoos and aquariums really needed support and understanding about how to shape those purposes, how to shape those outcomes, and I'm going to say moving beyond the what. Now, if I said to you, can you describe what you do in your conservation education? You might be all be able to do that. You might say, yeah, we do summer camps and we do education sessions and um, we might work with um, young people, we might work with adults. That's what you do. And so I would say that most people will be able to say they would be able to describe what they do. Then if you move to kind of how you do it, if I said, can you describe the tools and techniques and what makes it so unique? Then again, most people would be able to do that. But if I said, could you describe what the purposes of the conservation education at your zoo and aquarium are, then this is where it starts to unravel. And it's a really interesting thing because doing something, doing what you do is actually, is easier than actually having a very a clear purpose. And so that's why this chapter exists because what we want to do is make sure that zoos and aquariums take a step forward. They need to take a, a different approach to really understand instead of thinking about what you're doing, we need to move to thinking about why we're doing it. And so that's where we're gonna start with our kind of first question. Now, um, the first question that we had was thinking about the purposes, the whys in our conservation education. Um, you know, why is that important? Why do we think I've said it's important? You know, that could be my personal opinion. We're gonna get the views from our, our panel. Kim, I'm gonna come to you first. Um, you know, if we think about um, your zoo or your kind of work in, in different locations, why do you think having clear purposes is an important thing to have? Yeah, that's a really great question and, and something that I think we, we struggle with as an organization. Uh, but I think the why is really just then how, how do you know if you've been successful? Um, you know, it, it's you need to define if you're trying to build a rocket, you need to define, are you building a rocket to go to the moon? Are you trying to get to Mars? Are you headed for something beyond what we know? Uh, because that's going to impact how you how you build that rocket. And so it's kind of the same with programs of you need to know what you're trying to accomplish and why we are why we're doing it so that you know how you're going to build whatever it is, your program, your experience, your opportunities that you're having. So then you know if you've reached your goal based on whatever you've built. Um, that's kind of my analogy for it um, this, this early in the morning for me, <laughs> but it, it just, it helps you know where you're trying to get to. And then if you actually got there or not, once you've completed whatever you're doing. 
Thank you, Kim. Yeah, and I appreciate it. Very articulate for a very early morning. Uh, Leanne, we'll come to you next. Um, adding on to what Kim was talking about, what's your view on this question? Yeah, and, and I would um, agree with Kim. We went through a really big shift at Zuzu Toria um, well over 10 years ago, and we redefined what our purpose was for existing, and that was to fight extinction and secure a future rich in wildlife. And so we, we thought our programs um, were doing that. They were actually inspiring um, kids to go away and actually act to save wildlife. Um, so we had that there, but we hadn't actually stopped to check. So for us, it was defining that why um, really well and really clearly. And then we stopped to check whether we're actually doing that. So, you know, similar to what Kim said, it helps you to know um, if you've got that strong purpose and why if you actually got there um, and we didn't. And so what that meant was having that really strong why. Um, that didn't change, even though we didn't make it there. It meant we had to go back and look at um, what, you know, why we wanted to do this, what we were going to do and, and use the right tools. But it really does give you that, you know, sometimes people talk about that true north. And so it helps to bring together not only what we're doing, but also the wider zoo that I work in. We're all working towards that one goal. Thanks, Leanne. And we'll come back to something you said about kind of checking back in, because I think there's a really interesting relationship between defining purposes and, and being able to, I'm not going to say it's easier, but being able to then check back in to see if you got there. Because if you have no purpose, if you haven't got articulated why you're doing something, how are you going to be able to evaluate it? Because you don't have, as you say, that that north that you're you're kind of pointing towards. Uh, so we'll come to you, Aphantis, um, uh, to to kind of uh, round up this this conversation. Why do you feel that having strong purposes in conservation education is important? Yes, I I want to just start by defining an aspect that is uh, when people talk about. Uh, zoos and aquarium in the context of most of the western world the situation is a bit different in like in the case of most of the areas in africa where we have our audiences that we target coming from being being, being diverse most of them bordering being the immediate neighbors of our conservation areas and it is very important really to think about ask that question about whether we are really targeting our audience because we want them to participate in conservation directly or to make an impact of the wildlife or the environment that they interact with every day because they contribute to conservation or not, or is just an opportunity for them to just come, relax, be happy and all that. So conservation education program really need to be the objectives, the purpose, the why, is really a very key thing because if that is well defined, then it becomes a channel to really contribute to conservation. When it is not well defined, then it becomes just an opportunity to host them, and then they are not really another factor to, uh, to help you achieve conservation goals. Thanks, Afantas. And yeah, you know, you talked about a number of different purposes in your in your conversation about, you know, coming together for a, a day out together, which I think is an important purpose to bring people together in our in our facilities, but also that kind of sharper purpose of having conservation action and advocacy. And so, yeah, you know, we, we've we've started with this big question, but there's lots of things that, uh, you know, uh, I immediately want to go to. I'm going to stick with you, Afantas. Just carrying on, you know, talking about your communities that you work with, one of the things that's mentioned in the in the strategy around a purpose is that we might have a purpose of what we'd like to do, but sometimes that's quite different to what our community thinks the purpose of the zoo is. And so how do you start connecting and working and building those relationships with the communities you work with to make sure that those purposes, those kind of conversations, those programs start to align? What kind of things do you do, you do with, our, with the community? Yes, I just want to mention that um, we are living in a situation in this country, uh, more specifically in Kenya, whereby we have much of the visits to conservation areas is really students, for example, they just want to go and 
see the wild tribe they have never seen in their life. And again, whenever they send a message that they want to participate, to, to visit and see the animals, then we start building an interest on and dividing the purpose that they are not just visiting to see the animals, but to wish them to really feel that our engagement is not just about showing, but also about engaging them to appreciate the, the, the number, the challenges this wild drive is facing and helping them realize that they can do something to make the difference. So in a way, their initial interest may be just to see, but again, when we have the group as they prepare for their coming, we have to ensure that we make it clear that they appreciate that they have a responsibility. So they go home having seen the animals, but also appreciated their role in conservation. And the, the group, different various groups, in my case, that we are, I work with are students and community groups, and then we engage them on different aspects. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to acknowledge the motivation of our communities about why they want to visit us. You know, seeing animals up close, having those kind of connections to nature is really important. And um, if you look at the, the chapter, you'll notice that we define and describe uh, five different kind of general purposes. Uh, and one of the reasons why we wanted to do that was to go beyond I mean, when I started in Zoos and Aquariums, it was very much, yes, people still wanted to come and see animals. And my role as a, an education officer was just to tell them knowledge about the animal. So it was, here is the wonders of the natural world, and that's it. And so that builds knowledge and understanding. I'm going to say that is really important. Let's not knock uh, making sure that we raise awareness of the, you know, the beautiful natural world around us. But what we know is that if we can't stop there, knowing about species, knowing about conservation issues, knowing about the world around us is not going to motivate that conservation action that you described, Afanta. So working with the communities to, to acknowledge uh, the reasons why they will come to, to, to your kind of facility, but also then to build on that, to enrich that with those kind of really strong purposes that we are, are wanting uh, as conservation organisations. So Kim, if I come to you next, uh, just building on uh, a fantasy's comments, uh, what else are you thinking around this uh, question? Um, so definitely, you know, the connections and team, and to your point, the cognitive gains that uh, people think they want. And I think, we have to think about all the different audiences. I'll give an example here of a lot of what I oversee are programs for school groups. And so that's where the teachers are coming to us and they want those cognitive gains. They're meeting their learning standards that have been set for them. We kind of refer to it as teaching to the test. Um, so that's what they want. But Sarah, to your point, we want to affect behavior change. We want to affect, you know, we want to increase effective emotions. We want to, we want to save the world. Um, and I'm going to throw another piece in here, too, of um, a lot of the audiences that we work with are underserved or under-resourced, and so we depend a lot upon donors and grants, and they sometimes have a little bit different view as well of, of what they think that their money should be used for. And so it's, it's finding that perfect niche of where does the donor want their money to go? You know, they, they want to say, let's say, they want to say that we're going to increase test scores. Um, that's not, that's not my mission. You know, if you look at the mission of my organization, of my department, we even have a philosophy statement in our department and nowhere does it mention we're going to increase test scores, <laughs> you know, but we do say that we are going to promote positive behavior change. We're going to um, use evidence-based and inclusive learning. We are going to um, be leaders in conservation education. So by referring back to here are our standards, you know, here's what the teachers are looking for. Here's what the donors are looking for. It can all come together and it does work. It does work. We just have to listen to those audiences and figure out where are those overlaps that we have that sweet spot of what we're all doing. And then it just increases access and uh, uh, opportunities for everyone, which is really what it comes down to. You know, we, we want everyone to have whatever goals they're trying to meet at the zoo, but we all have our own, but we're going to overlap it and we're going to figure it out and it's going to result in something amazing and wonderful. 
And you, you said something listening to our communities, and I know you've done a lot of listening and connecting with the communities at your zoo. Do you want to just kind of uh, give us some examples of uh, either surprising things that you found out that were those kind of mismatches or um, ways that you're learning as an organisation about how to connect and listen and acknowledge the communities in your neighbourhood? Yeah, I think I think the biggest example I can give right now is maybe three years ago. COVID has thrown off my timeline completely, but in the last few years, um, my organization, um, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri in the U.S., and our um, main campus, what we've called the main campus at this point, is landlocked. We're in the middle of an urban park. We cannot expand. We've known for years that we need additional space, and so in the last few years, we bought some um, acreage about 25 miles away from the zoo proper that is going to be a, another campus that we're opening in a few years. And we really wanted to work with and hear from the community about what they wanted from that zoo. We knew from our previous studies that uh, maybe the people that live in that area were not necessarily coming to the zoo um, the zoo proper at our main campus. And um, one thing to note too is our zoo is free to, to get in. We don't have ticket prices. We are completely free for anyone and everyone. And so we really wanted to seek to understand of why isn't our visitorship reflecting necessarily the demographics in our area. And so we, and we embarked on a very long journey of um, working with partners that we already had in the area where we're going to be expanding and then going out into the community and finding out, you know, what do you want from the zoo as a new neighbor in your area? Um, how can we support you? What are things that work well already? You know, we don't want to repeat necessarily something that already exists or something that you don't need. And um, we spent about a year doing focus groups, listening to the community, working with community leaders, and it got some really great data um, regarding, um, you know, in, especially with this particular audience, um, opportunities for high school internships, which is not something that our organization currently has. So it's something that we're able to work towards. And one thing we heard very clearly is it's paid internships. And so going back to the piece I mentioned earlier about, you know, this is something our community needs. What can we offer as an organization? And then where do we bring in the donor that fits in with that? I, I will say we haven't gotten there yet, but, but it is something that we're working on where those pieces are coming together to figure out, okay, what is this, this niche that we can meet? Um, and I can keep talking about this, but that was just one example um, off the top of my head that I came up with. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. I know that was on the spot, but, um, you know, that, that paid internship um, really links to the skills purpose that we have in this chapter. Um, and for me, one of the one of the, the things I like about those five points, those five areas of purpose, is it really kind of uh, makes sure that you don't kind of forget those areas that are, are less familiar to yourself. Uh, and so thinking about the community. So, yeah, you know, why then it coming? What else can we do? And 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 hearing that they would like support and training and career pathways and skill development, personal, technical, scientific, that means that you can kind of have a shared purpose that also meets your mission as an organization, but acknowledges the community voice as well. And so when we think for me, when we think about purpose, yes, what what we as the organization, what our mission, what our strategy what our knowledge and expertise of what conservation education is. But there's actually quite a lot of other things I think have to be considered. And that could be, you know, different curricula, different cultures, uh, different kind of regional and national frameworks. It's all about what kind of goes into those uh, different programs, this different conservation education to come out with the purposes that you, you know, will, will give you those conservation and social outcomes uh, that we talk about a lot in the strategy. Now I'm going to come to Leanne, um, you know, Zoo's Victoria is well known for having a very strong uh, behaviour uh, purpose in its uh, conservation education. And so do you want to just talk about some of the um, some of the ways that you're kind of working in your organisation and how you're working with the community in, in the purpose space? Yeah, and for us, we've got a number of different um, what we call community conservation campaigns, or you can think about them just as programs, behaviour change programs. But what we do is um, our purpose is, is always linked to a threatening process. And our uh, whole purpose is to alleviate that human-driven threatening process to a particular wildlife species. 
Um, so one of the, the examples is uh, shearwaters that live on off an island off the east coast of Australia um, who have been ingesting um, plastic and you know 100% of the chicks have a full um, gut full of plastic. And so one of the, the most common and readily identifiable items was um, balloon fragments and balloon clips and balloon lines. So for us, that was really a clear one that our community was um, impacting on those species. And so what could we do that could actually turn that around? So there's a whole, we, where we start with that, that's our, our clear one. So anything that we're doing, we wanna check back in and go, are we actually um, decreasing that threat for that, that species? And so for us, um, we use a framework that we call Connect, Understand, Act. And basically it, it works through a number of steps where we identify what's the um, action that our community could do. And in that case, um, we didn't want to be the fun police. Um, we knew that wouldn't work. So telling people to stop using balloons outdoors is really the goal that we want. Um, but we ask them to switch to using bubbles instead of balloons. And that was off the back of um, focus groups and research that we did um, that people said we were, were asking them about the, um, their beliefs around using both those and they came out as both as equally as fun as each other so we were replacing um, that behavior but for us it's always it's measuring what we're actually um, changing in our community we want to change we want them to help them fall in love with seabirds and understand the issue of of um, plastic pollution more and change their behavior but ultimately it comes back to that um, really big goal is are we actually making an impact on that threatening process and so that's where um, we always have that set up in our framework so we can check back in on not just the social impact but the biological impact and I'll touch on um, what Kim mentioned before about um, understanding what that purpose is so that you can talk to um, you know stakeholders like donors but it's also really important for our community um, you know, at zoos and aquariums are increasingly being questioned about our role um, and our purpose and what part we play in the community. So understanding what your impact your programs are having um, can help you um, really positively impact on that social license to operate. So helping share with that community an understanding of the positive impact that you're having in the world and that unique role that we can play. So that's really, um, you know, it's it, it absolutely critical for donors. Uh, we have that as well um, in trying to secure grants, but it's also just for that general acceptance um, across your community too. Great, thanks, Leanne. Um, we're going to see if there's any questions from our audience. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can either write in the chat box um, and we either to myself directly or to the group or you can just pop your hand up. Um, any responses, any comments, questions uh, so far? I'm gonna give you a couple of moments just to have a think about that, think you've got any questions. Um, one of the things that I would like to add is that, you know, um, when we think about purpose, um, one of the, a recent conversation that I had was about, but what happens if my, you know, my organization just wants us to make money? Now, I'm gonna say that making money is a result, not a purpose. But it's quite tricky because I think conservation education is is in this is an interesting space in zoos and aquariums. We know that uh, during the last uh, couple of years we've been I was going to say battered, but that, maybe that is the right word. But you know we've been really um, you know uh, challenged by uh, the zoo closures, by kind of different uh, operating models, as all having to to kind of uh, learn how to do stuff online if you haven't done that already. Um, but one of the things that it keeps coming back is that kind of the balance between return on mission, that's what I call it, and return on investment. So the, the kind of financial side and the, and, the, and the purpose side. And so when somebody says, yes, but my organization just wants us to make money, that's an interesting statement. And I'm going to say that's fine because they're not kind of one or the other. You can absolutely have a brilliant program that has really great purposes that drives conservation and social outcomes and it can still uh, drive a revenue. But what we want to kind of uh, have with this strategy is for us to be, uh, as Leanne and, and Kim were talking about, I think it's a really strong proposition to be able to really lay out what are the core purposes of your conservation education, either as a whole, as a whole portfolio of stuff, as your team or your organization or an individual program. But what I wanna say is that for me, 
the, the monetary side is important, but it's to me, it's not a purpose uh, of what we do. It is a mechanism or result uh, of that. Now, I see Nancy's got a hand up. I'm going to go over to you. Just want to tell us um, where you're calling in from and, and, and where what organisation you're from as well. That'd be great. I'm, I'm currently in the UK. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the University of Plymouth, and I've actually just finished my master's in uh, zoo conservation biology. And I did my research on technology and education in at Peyton Zoo. And I'm in the process of writing a proposal for a PhD looking specifically at behavioral changes around food wastage and uh, wildlife uh, habitat loss. And one of my questions, because you're bringing up uh, money, um, is when it comes to your programs and the effects they have on behavioral change. Um, and as you've mentioned in, in the chapter, you know, behavioral change has a lot to do with social economic issues. And, and Kim, as you pointed out, your zoo is free and you're in an environment where you have a lot of low income, you know, and some uh, justice struggles. Have you done a study or is, you know, is it something out there that's showing, do you have more success with your programs in terms of changing behavior because you are more accessible in terms of being free compared to other zoos? Because I know the zoos here are, are quite expensive. And so it's, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's maybe a one-off thing that a whole family could actually go and participate in the zoo. And I found with my, um, my research is they really didn't want to be bothered. They just want to go and have a good time. And so I wasn't, my outcomes probably, you know, I'm like, well, I'm not sure how successful they were, but because we were dealing with a financial issue. So just curious if you found that you've had better outcomes because you're free. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, so, you know, behavioral change, I think is one of, as we all know, one of the hardest things to evaluate because it is longitudinal. I think what we truly evaluate is intent to behavior change. And often, you know, we use that as to say, oh yes, we're affecting behavior change. Well, no, we're affecting intent to behavior change. So longitudinally, um, we have, I don't believe um, we've done that. I would honestly need to check with our um, audience research and evaluation department, uh, but I'm not aware of any studies taking place of, of just our general visitorship. We do know that when compared to visitors who don't speak with an educator, those that do speak with an educator tend to rate everything at our organization significantly higher. They think the grounds are cleaner. They think that our food is better. But the big thing that we see there is that we do see a significant difference in the number of people who understand the conservation work that we're doing. So we are getting a message out there in some way, whether it's affecting behavior change, I don't know. We have done one longitudinal study with what we call our um, team volunteers, specifically in education. They're called our Zoo Alive teens. And um, we do know that we have seen behavior change from them over the course of the years. Um, so they can come in when they're 15 and we have several teens that have gone on to work in zoos as keepers, as educators, as interpreters and when we ask them to reflect back on their journey and their experience getting there, they have said, my experiences at the zoo as a zoo alive teen influenced my path. So not general visitorship, um, but something that we know that is having an impact in that regard. So we, we know that our formula is working so we can extrapolate that we're probably influencing some sort of behavior change, but to put hard numbers and data on it, I don't have that handy. So if that answers and, your question. And I can add to that, there isn't um, anything that I, any studies that I know of that compare with between paid venues or, or free venues. Um, we're a paid venue, so our admission um, for uh, a child is $20. Um, so um, students pay $20 to come in Australian dollars. Um, but we did do, we, we do follow up studies six months afterwards um, with visitors for our particular campaigns and, and looking at um, what behaviours they've, they've taken up. Um, but we did a study where 
we um, basically saturated the experience where it, with um, actions that they could take at the zoo. Um, we, the intent was to actually see how far we could go until we started to become a nag around different conservation actions you could do. Um, but I think it was uh, across the, the two properties that we did it, we only hit uh, about 3% of people's um, theoretical threshold of, of how many messages were too many. And um, the rest of them had said that their experience improved because they were being asked to take action. Um, and they were very easy, tangible actions they could take on site or um, commit to doing um, when they left. And so we saw a really positive correlation with the number of, of actions that they were asked um, to improving their visitor experience. So um, that was a study done by Monash University um, in conjunction with us. And so, yeah, it's, a, it's one that I bring out even for my staff um, who ask me, you know, is this too much? <laughs> Are we asking them to do too much? And I say no. <laughs> I do think, Leanne, with a lot of your campaigns that they're not, <laughs> they're never dry, they're never, you know, I do think that some of the historical behaviour change campaigns were, you know, uh, um, quite full of uh, doom and gloom and guilt yes. um, and yes. the, the approach that you have taken, because you are, you know, your Connect Understand Act is acknowledging the knowledge component, the emotional connection, the behaviour change and weaving those together and so for me, the, the stuff I see at your sites is not that it's a fun day out or it's behavior change. It's actually kind of woven mm -hmm. together. And I think that's yeah. what zoos and aquariums have to learn is that, you know, yes, absolutely. People are going to patent zoo. The financial cost is one aspect of why they do or don't go. Um, but how then while they're there, how do you weave in those kind of narratives to make sure that it is part of that good day out that time with family that making memories but it's part of that mission as well I mean for for us at Auckland Zoo we um I think I mentioned it in the last uh, reading group it's quite fresh so I'll mention it again we did have a scheme where we uh, supported uh, diverse communities to come to the zoo and we actually had quite a few people even with a um a complimentary ticket for their whole family up to a group of 10 um they they didn't come and so we we're really interested in saying okay so we've got rid of uh, a perceived barrier of the cost of entry but what else is going on and actually when you realize that the cost of transport the cost of childcare, the working schedules when people can get out of work life happens COVID happens and so for me it's understanding what is going on in in somebody's life in a community's life and that's where I think listening and understanding of what's going on can really support and acknowledge how you know how they might come to the zoo but I know that certainly at Auckland Zoo, what we're trying to do is go outside of those zoo walls. For a long time, zoos and aquariums have kind of waited for people to come to them. And so they can deliver those conservation messages. Whereas actually, I know that lots and lots of places are doing amazing work where they're really understanding actually, where can we be at where our community is? And so enacting that kind of change in places where the community is. So really going out um, in, a, in a relevant and authentic way. Um, and so, Nancy, thank you so much for your question. Great question. Um, and I think that will keep us thinking for a while. Uh, I'm just going to check to see if there's any other questions in our chat. Ah, we do have a question from Jaja. Hello. What question have you got? Do you want to introduce yourself first? Tell us where you're calling in from. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm from uh, Tallinn Zoo in uh, Estonia. Uh, and uh, I'm looking for advice. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, okay, uh, at uh, our zoo specifically, we've uh, had some uh, trouble explaining our purposes to some of our employees uh, who do tours for groups. And uh, usually the issue is uh, uh, with uh, people who come to the zoo uh, from like established uh, tour guide experience, but uh, they've uh, done tours uh, in the city, or you know, like around the country, uh, and uh, they are very entertainment-oriented people, uh, and uh, so they uh, they can learn about the animals, and they can learn about the zoo industry and uh, what we do besides the entertainment. But um, from conversation with them, I see that they don't really get it. 
Uh, and uh, part of it is definitely that we don't communicate it clearly enough. Um, they've also gone through training like uh, quite a few years ago, so they need uh, like a refresher. But I was wondering if uh, maybe you have some experience in uh, overcoming such challenges. Okay, so um, if I'm, to say, I'm going to come to you, but just so I understand the question. So you've got people who work in, in your zoo who are more entertainment focused and you might have done some training, but they still don't get that conservation purpose. And you're asking how our panel and the audience um, addresses getting that conservation purpose out to different employees in the zoo. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. That's good. We always like to know <laughs> the question. Uh, Francis, if we go to you first, uh, what have you got to say about that question? Yes. Uh... Uh, thank you very much for bringing up that. And I, at the same time, I know somebody, one of the participants by name, Rillian, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe in a position to also respond on the same, now that the Equally Learn and Education Center, and they also receive visitors. But in our case, I want to mention that ours is not really a zoo, but uh, a conservancy that we receive students, we have a dedicated conservation education center, and we have uh, tourism facilities that handle tourists whose major purpose or interest would be to have an experience with wild drive, have um, a nice day that the, the, a day out. And uh, one of the things that we have been doing occasionally is uh, to communicate to the guides in, in, in specific times on one on the purpose of the organization or not we are trying to achieve as an institution. And uh, more important to help them realize that they, they be, become part of the communicators to their visitors that whatever they are enjoying to see, really everyone has a responsibility to contribute in its conservation. And this is because conservation aspects would lead uh, from issues to do with waste management, respect for nature, and uh, the same message that we are really communicating to the young, uh, the, the, the children and uh, the learners from various learning institutions can still be communicated to the visitors, if really the guides and those tourism operators appreciate that whatever they are showing to their visitors really need to be enjoyed today, tomorrow, and therefore we still feel they have a responsibility to contribute to a, a, a clean environment through proper waste management, inspecting of nature, and that's the message that we really want to really them appreciate. Again, uh, appreciating the law of culture in conservation, I think uh, tour guides can really play a very important role in communicating that. Thanks, Afantas. And yeah, uh, two things I, I heard there. One, yes, you know, linking to chapter one, everybody in the organization has a role to play in conservation education and it's really supporting them uh, to understand what their, what their bit is. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think gone are the days where it's, you know, educators and education departments and then people who say, oh, I just work in the shop. It's nothing to do with me. Whereas certainly at my organization, uh, right from that very first kind of day, first induction, we talk about our mission, we talk about our kind of seven strategic commitments, and we talk about how each and every role is really connected to them. And so for me, it's it's making the connection. So at your place, uh, Daja, what your colleagues uh, connection may be different, but it has the same purpose, it has the same kind of, uh, to Leanne's point, that same kind of North Star, where are we all going together? And so trying to kind of contextualize how they play a role and entertainment and, and bringing that kind of good day out is very important, but how do we kind of uh, contribute to each and every person in our organization about what they can do and what part they can play? Uh, Lillian, I can see you have your hand up. Do you have a different question or would you like to add up to, to this response? I, I want to give, uh, to give a comment. First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for this wonderful session. I'm Lillian Nyabicha from Kenya Wildlife Service in Kenya. Welcome. So what I wanted to add, to add is that for our case in, uh, in Kenya, as a uh, uh, Fantas has put it, it's quite different 
because we focus on all cadres of, of, uh, of people from the young kids in schools to community members because we want to involve all people in conservation. We want to, them to appreciate conservation and take an active role in, it, in, in the conservation, more specifically of, wild, of, of wildlife and the natural environment. So in Kenya, we have our protected areas which are spread all over the country. And uh, Kenya Wildlife Service, one of the core mandates that we do is to promote conservation education so that the public can be able to appreciate nature, appreciate wildlife, and be able to partake in its conservation. And we work very closely with the, our stakeholders. We have conservancies. These are communities or individuals who have come up to, put, to set aside space for conservation. So we work very closely with them to ensure that there's, the children who are going to schools within the, the ecosystems have embraced the conservation and they are up, taking an active role in, uh, in uh, environmental related activities like uh, waste management in schools, tree planting initiatives in schools, among others. And for the communities, we also have specific uh, programs conservation education, specific programs for the communities, because we want them to participate more so in uh, reducing the impacts of habitat destruction and also to create more space for wildlife conservation. We realize that Kenya as a country, we have set aside uh, very minimal space for wildlife and nature conservation, and yet we need to coexist with our wildlife, we need to coexist with nature. And so through the conservation education forums, we've managed to entice many communities and we've seen so many communities coming up. We have seen so many individuals coming up to establish conservancies for purposes of wildlife conservation. So it's an activity, conservation education is an activity that we have really embraced as a country so that we can have our, our environment well conserved. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lily. And that was such a brilliant comment because what I heard was around that it is a culture, you know, that whole country approach to, to conservation. And I always think that zoos and aquariums are like part of a constellation of people's lives because they can get information. They can get those behavior change connections from lots of different places. And you've just described that constellation in your country and, and how your organization fits in. Uh, Margaret, I know that you're also uh, calling in from Kenya. Do you want to add to our conversation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I have a problem with my camera. So I'm oh, unable okay. to... We can hear you really okay. well. You can, you can hear me clearly. That's really nice. Okay, so my name is Margaret Otieno, and I'm an environmental educator, not necessarily directly within a zoo. I'm involved in various um, uh, organizations but mainly based at the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya. I would like to say something about zoos, that is uh, 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 environmental education uh, associated with zoos and uh, organizations, uh, resource mobilization and uh, need, that is a finance need, which is something that uh, is really coming out very strongly. You have just mentioned that uh, uh, some of us are uh, made aware by the organizations that employers that what we want to see is money. So I just want to uh, give a comment about this too. And specifically, I want to talk about what we do at the Giraffe Center or uh, the African Fund for Endangered Wildlife, where I am a director. Uh, so we have, zoo, we have a zoo, really, it is a zoo because we have the Rothschild Giraffe. And the main purpose is to create awareness about the Rothschild giraffe and other endangered species. So there is, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, education and awareness activities around that. But at the same time, we are open to tourists, both local and international. And to be able to come to the giraffe center and uh, have a close look at the giraffes and feed them, we, we, we use uh, a pellets. Uh, and, and the giraffes love them. So that really attracts the giraffes and that makes the guests very, very excited. To do that, you have to pay a fee. And we have to make this money because that is what enables us to buy the pellets, uh, to, uh, to pay the education officers and uh, even just the guards who protect the giraffes. So we need that money and we encourage our employees to, to really up their game so that we can attract 
as many guests as possible to the giraffe center, because it's only through that that we'll be able to conserve the Rothschild giraffe, create awareness, and apart from that, also support other organizations who are involved in uh, the conservation of endangered species. So the two can go together. We can create awareness and education, and at the same time, um, mobilize or uh, raise some money to, to support the infrastructure and the processes of conserving the endangered wildlife. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, couldn't agree more, Margaret. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, uh, we are about 10 minutes to go. Um, Kim, you just popped a, a comment in the in the chat. I want you. To, I want to come to you. Um, you like the phrase "conservation education is an activity." Do you want to just expand on that? It, it was just something that Lillian said that kind of struck me uh, that conservation education is an activity because it really brought to mind that when I think of activity, it's ongoing. It's not a one and done kind of thing. And that it kind of struck me as like, oh wow, that's really conservation education. You know, it's it's not a one and done thing. We're hoping for continual change. We're hoping for repeat guests or experiences. And, and it just, I, I just really liked that because it really brought home to me that it's, it's not someone sitting at a desk necessarily writing reports. It's working with the community. It's understanding that why in order to meet their needs, like you have to actively pursue what you're trying to accomplish. And, and, and I don't know, that just really caught me for some reason. No, thank you so much, Kim. Um, and one of the things I was gonna uh, comment on is that, you know, if, if you're thinking about, okay, how do I even have that kind of, a conversation with yourself about what are the purposes for a program for, for my entire conservation education activity? And something I really like to do is if you look at the um, recommendation in chapter two, it's got the five bullet points um, where it's got build knowledge and understanding about species and natural world and zoo and aquarium contributions to conservation. What I often do is just take the, um, the, the end of the sentence off and I say, you know, if I'm thinking about a new program, an activity, uh, a piece of interpretation, I might say, OK, if I want to build knowledge and understanding, what is the knowledge and understanding I want to build? And so for me, I really like those prompts as a way that you can say, what is the, you know, what, why do we want to promote awe and wonder and enjoyment and creativity about um, pest species in New Zealand? Um, why, what, what kind of advocacy, what kind of behavior change, what kind of skills are we looking at? And so for me, actually the recommendations in, in the chapter, those different purposes actually are a neat little prompt that I use um, uh, as well as thinking as that broader thing there is a, a, a paragraph that talks about a theory of change. And to me, a very simple way of, of thinking about a theory of change is, you know, what is the change that I'm, I wish to make from this program, from this activity, from this entire scheme of work? That really big kind of approach. And it, you know, then you can get into more detail about mapping this out. But for me, actually having those um, five different bullet points is a neat little quick tool just to remind myself to say, okay, what is it that we're talking about? And we were using this um, with uh, some keepers the other day. And so, you know, talking about a project, uh, thinking about how they can think about what the purposes for a joint project could be. Actually, it's a really nice way that you can involve colleagues in that conversation without them thinking, you're asking me to write outcomes, you're asking me to write kind of big uh, statements about why I want to do that, was actually, I'm, I'm finding that that little kind of, um, the, the bullet points, the prompts, the five areas of, of purpose is actually a, a useful tool that we've been using here at Auckland Zoo. Uh, we have six minutes left. I'm gonna see if there's any questions. Oh, um, I can see we've got, uh, we've got one question in the chat. So I'm gonna uh, read it out uh, from uh, Thumbo. Um, you're seeking more guidance on where to get further information on measuring behavior change. Oh, this is good. We've got six minutes. Um, let's see if we can get uh, um, uh, some information about that. Uh, to be honest, it's really challenging to tell whether or not we're creating an impact. Now, um, Leanne mentioned this connection between purpose and, and checking in to see how you're doing right at the beginning. So if we come to you, um, uh, what comments and uh, a response have you got to, to Thembo's question? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really big one. And I think this one will be unpacked also in one of the later chapters as well um, in another reading group. So I'd encourage you to come back to that one too, Sambo. Um, 
what we do is be really clear on what the objective is. And so, um, you know, if, if the objective is to have, um, you know, 20,000 people promise to blow bubbles, not balloons. So we actually then make sure that we're putting in an evaluation to, to measure one, those commitments. But it's really challenging to actually follow up with what happens um, when, once the visitor leaves the zoo. So we generally partner with a university um, and we work with either an honours student or a PhD student and ask them to actually work with us on a study that actually looks at um, what's happening before the campaign, um, after we launch the campaign and then six months later. And so that's actually following up particular visitors six months later to actually see what change that they've done and is that change actually a result of what they learnt or did or the commitment that they made, um, for example, for the Blow Bubbles Not Balloons um, campaign. So it is really hard. Um, we, we've had to partner um, with, with um, university students to be able to uh, achieve that. Other times um, we actually do just a quick lit review to actually see um, if a behaviour or an action that we're asking um, and wanting to do in our program um, has been done before and actually looking at and, and doing a bit of a search to see who's done that, what, what have they found that's successful um, and how have they measured it and is that a way that we could actually measure it effectively. Um, we also use a, a, a sort of integrated bit of community-based social marketing from Doug McKenzie Moore and he's got a great website too with um, chat boards and people that you can link up with that may be doing a, a similar program to you and so getting some advice on how they've implemented that and measured it afterwards as well. So that's probably my short answer. Um, it's not very specific, but always happy to chat. And so I can pop my email in the, um, in the chat box if, you, if you've got a particular example that um, I can help with, just more specific advice. Thanks, Leanne. And yeah, I, we're gonna say that, yes, you think it's hard, we all think it's hard and so, one of the reasons why there is four um, recommendations in the strategy around uh, evaluation research measurement is because we want to, we know it's hard, we know it's a challenge, we know that many people are on that journey, but really putting those kind of uh, recommendations in hopefully helps people map out where we think zoos and aquariums uh, should be going. Um, for me, I'm going to uh, come to um, Ifantis and then Kim, but from my perspective, it is really that relationship between knowing what the, the outcome, what the purpose is, and then thinking about how are the different ways you can measure it. And so you'll notice that in the behaviour um, uh, recommendation, it says motivates uh, pro-environmental behaviours, actions and advocacy. And I remember when we were editing it, one of the editors said, can we add the word motivation in? Because if we say we need to evidence behavior change, which is what it used to be, you know, the, it was, oh yes, we're going to absolutely measure and demonstrate that zoos and aquariums absolutely change people's behavior. It's incredibly tricky. And so, um, you know, if we can say, actually thinking about that constellation of experiences, how can we prove that we're motivating, we're contributing to how people think, feel and act towards a natural world? Um, and that, you know, if, if you're thinking about behaviour change, there's lots of different dimensions. And so for me, it's understanding that purpose. It is about, you know, behaviour comes and is related to how people feel, their wellness and their well-being, how connected they are to nature, how much they know. And so it may be that you say, OK, well, you can't get to the bodily behaviour change yet. But our bit at the moment is we do want to raise awareness, but we know that by raising awareness, then further along the kind of piece, we'll start thinking about how we can connect people to messages and then we'll start kind of thinking about behaviour change. So for me, it is not about attribution so much between what you're doing and the change you're making. It's really understanding the contributions and what else is going on to think about how, how people think, feel and act towards a natural world. Again, that's a short response in, in a few minutes um, and we, we'll be getting that to that in, in chapter eight. I mean, evaluation pops up everywhere uh, and it's a brilliant question. So if we come to Afantis, uh, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, do you wanna just give your comments on measuring um, a change? Yes, my, my comments on this uh, issue is that, um, just like you mentioned earlier, that zoos now are looking behind the walls of the zoos. It's one of the things that I would encourage that whenever we think about uh, when we engage the students, our audiences, our visitors, 
sometimes it's very difficult to really tell what impact we have had until we go out to where they came from and be able to really make a follow-up to understand on the short term what they're able to do. But again, we need to think about uh, the long-term impact evaluation, which is one of the things that most of the conservation education programs have difficulties in following up. Because uh, we say that the bigger impact on conservation education is in the long term, whereas the short term is just the knowledge shift. And uh, if a conservation education program that engages visitors, purpose to look at their engagement two years, five years, and 10 years later, then you are able to have a, a reflection. And I'm saying this because at the time I've been handling involved in students. I already have like examples of people who would come back to me and tell me through the experience that I received 10 years ago when I was young, I was able to make a decision that today, this is what I'm doing. I think long-term evaluation is one component that is lost. And I think we need to find ways as institutions to be able to capture that. Thanks, Afantas. What a great moment to have that somebody said something 10 years ago that you helped that person achieve. And now, now they're doing what you thought they might be doing. So brilliant. Uh, Kim, take us home. We're, we're, um, uh, we've got, we're two minutes over. We're going to keep going. Um, okay. If you haven't looked in the chat, there's a couple of things that I'm going to say. Um, Liana has popped her email address in um, and also the links to the community-based social marketing uh, site. If you do want to contact any of the board, uh, you can go to the IZD website and our details are on there. Um, but Kim, we've got a couple of minutes to kind of close us out. What kind of final comments have you got to share with us? Um, absolutely. So I think the important thing to remember with anyone that we're working with, they're on their own personal journey. Um, and we may or may not know where they are exactly. So when we're thinking about the evaluation impact change and so on, I, you know, I, I think that we just need to keep it very general. So we have some standard questions that we ask of any program that we do. And it's, it's just kind of asking them to evaluate where they are on their journey. So things like, did were you inspired to learn more? Did it increase your caring for animals and nature? Um, did it give you an idea of way to help, you know, nature and conservation. And so those are very broad questions that can be applied to anyone, no matter where they are in their journey, but it does give you some indication then of was your program successful based upon what you, going back to that why, based on what you wanted it to be. So thinking about that too, of not asking very close-ended questions, but wording things to get some, some idea of have you met your why based on these questions that can then be evaluated across the board and evenly would be, I think my biggest suggestion that I would have or something that we have found to be successful at least. So bringing it home that that's what I've got. <laughs> I, I did. Thank you. Um, I did put in the chat too. I just want to mention that we do have our chapter three reading club scheduled for October. Um, so the registration link is there. You can check and see if it'll work for, for your date and time. Um, but otherwise I will pass it back over to Sarah to, to wrap it up and say goodbye. Thank you. And um, yeah, it, what a brilliant hour. I always think about, you know, the, these conversations going all sorts of different directions around the chapter. Hopefully you found it useful. Um, uh, and you've asked the questions, uh, do keep in contact, keep coming to these uh, reading group sessions. They are absolutely designed for you. And so any questions that you have around the chapters, anything about this chapter, uh, the strategy in general, you can ask as you register. Uh, I'd like to say a, a big thanks to Leanne, Ephantus and Kim, uh, who have been uh, part of our panel today. Um, and we'll, with that, I'll say, um, Goodbye and good evening and good morning and enjoy the rest of your day. So, Kira, bye bye.